right. Today, we're going to be talking about reducing the risk of complications in orthopedic lower extremity surgery. My name is Dr. Ravi Karia. I work in San Antonio at UT Health San Antonio, and I'm the chief of the Division of Orthopedic Trauma. Here are my faculty disclosures. Today's program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and HMP Global Company. It is supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare, the Medical Solutions Division. So today for learning objectives, we're gonna describe surgical site infections and the negative impact, not just on the patient, but on the entire healthcare system. We're gonna examine classic techniques as well as new technologies that we can use to help reduce the incidence of surgical site infections. More specifically, we're gonna go through tips on how to have better outcomes in lower extremity surgery. We're gonna review recent evidence in high quality peer reviewed journals to see how negative pressure and other new technologies can help with incisions and surrounding tissue management. And at the end, we're gonna go through a number of cases to better illustrate how these techniques as well as negative pressure can help improve outcomes in complex lower extremity cases. So when we discuss lower extremity orthopedic trauma cases, we're focused on both high energy and low energy mechanisms. The anatomic region tends to be the distal tibia and the hind foot. High energy fractures are more likely to occur in a lower age population that appear to be healthy. They usually do not have chronic medical conditions. However, as you'll see later, they tend to have poor lifestyle choices such as smoking and alcohol abuse, as well as malnutrition. The low energy fractures we're gonna focus on are within patients that have severe core morbid conditions like diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. These patients also have the same issues as the high energy patients in terms of malnutrition, as well as some poor lifestyle choices such as smoking and alcohol abuse. One of the things we're gonna focus on today is controlling of swelling. Swelling is expected in all of these surgeries. If we can control swelling, we can help decrease the incidence of surgical wound dehiscence as well as infection. Swelling is also painful, delays mobilization and delays rehab. So why are we at all concerned about surgical incisions? Well, outside of the obvious effects to the patients, when patients undergo these conditions, there's increased pain, there's a longer length of recovery, and they often need more surgeries. But before we even get to that, we have to discuss the financial implications. CMS has started to stop payment for certain conditions they believe to be preventable. For example, surgical site infections associated with hip and knee replacement are no longer covered by CMS. Hospitals also care a lot about these. They're focused on length of stay, and so surgical site infections can lead to significant increases in length of stay and significant increases in cost. So what can we do to help prevent these? Well, before learning what we can do to prevent them, we need to try to find out who and what procedures are at risk. So this is a very busy slide that has a lot of obvious information on it, but it is important to stay out loud. So there's patient related factors that are increasing risk for surgical site infections like diabetes, obesity, tobacco use. There are certain surgeries that have a higher risk such as amputations of the lower extremity. And then there's general incision related risk factors, wounds that have high tension, wounds that have been opened numerous times, severely traumatized tissue, et cetera. So how do we set ourselves up for success? And this is really what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna talk about closed versus open lower extremity fractures. We're gonna be talking about wound closure techniques, not just staple sutures, but other things that you can do to help modulate how you close. We're gonna be talking about nutrition. We're gonna be talking about managing core morbid conditions. And we're going to be talking about some new, modern, non-classic fixation techniques to help decrease the risk of complications. So jumping right into closed fractures. 
So just because they're closed does not mean that they've undergone severe trauma to the soft tissues. So we still need to respect the soft tissue envelope. We still need to wait for swelling to go down to allow for an incision. If there's blisters, we need to allow those to fully recover. We need to dissect carefully. What we mean by dissect carefully in layers, we wanna make an incision and try to dissect as close together all the way down to the fracture. So we have wide, thick layers that are better able to heal and less dead space. Technical efficiency is really important. This is not rushing through surgeries or focusing on speed, but it is staying efficient and staying on task to limit wound exposure to the outside environment. We discuss blistering. Blistering comes in multiple fashions. On the right there, you can see a serous blister, which although you need to allow that to recover and allow the skin to recover before you actually make an incision on it, that's very different than the severely traumatized hemorrhagic blister you see on the left. This is gonna take a significant amount of time. And oftentimes when you see that type of blistering, you might only be able to get temporary fixation for weeks, six to eight weeks before an incision can be made on that tissue. What about open fractures? Well, open fractures come in all different types of flavors. So you look at this open fracture in the clinical picture there, you see a small opening, but look at the fracture. This is the medial, posteromedial medial aspect of the lower extremity. You see uh, where that fracture came from. It came significantly more proximal to that. So all of that tissue from that medial spike down to that open wound has been traumatized and severely. Stepping up a notch, right? Here is another bad fracture with a severe open wound. But what's important is you don't have to have bad fractures to have bad open wounds. So here is a relatively simple femoral shaft fracture in a pediatric patient. And you can see the severe open wound that's associated with it. When we classify open fractures, we know all of us about the Gustillo classification. So as I've shown you, it's not always so simple to classify these. It's not always so simple to correlate severe fractures with severe open wounds. So what really is the purpose of this classification? It's always been looked at for research. Uh, however, we've just gone over to the variability of open wounds with fractures. In reality, it's most important for communication with the medical team. What do we do when we have open fractures? Well, the most important aspect that we can control is early administration of antibiotics. At our institution, our goal is to get antibiotics into open fracture patients within 30 minutes with a cutoff being one hour before we have a fallout. We need early and adequate surgical debridement. So we rarely debride open fractures in the middle of the night anymore and haven't for a number of years. One of the main reasons we don't is making sure that we have adequate surgical debridement, that we do a good job, that our teams do a good job uh, during the light of day. Fracture stabilization is extremely important and needs to happen early. Stability of the skeleton assists with soft tissue recovery. And remember, the fixation does not have to be definitive. And non-definitive fixation doesn't just mean X-fix. You can put temporizing plates to have stable soft tissue. And when it's ready for definitive care, remove them and add the definitive long-term fixation in. What about antibiotics? Well, again, busy slide, but this is what we've been taught, that grade one and two get some cephalosporin like ANCEF. In grade three, you need to add gram-negative coverage, such as a gentamicin. The history of antibiotics goes on for many, many years. We have been using antibiotics for open fractures for about 75 years. Despite that amount of time, to date, there are no randomized controlled trials comparing the use of different antibiotics. So we really only have practice guidelines and retrospective reviews to guide what we're using. So looking at some of these reviews, here's one from just a few years ago. And we learned that there's a large variety in recommendations on what antibiotics to use, in what situations, and for how long. None of them to date have been able to prove better. We think at least 24 hours is beneficial, but even that we don't have data to prove that. Here's another review, this one from our own institution on just type three open fractures. One of the things that was looked at in this paper is do we really need gram negative coverage? 
well, we can't rely on guidelines from OTA or the academy. And looking at all of the papers available, there's still no consensus on how long we do therapy, no consensus on what we use. And there does not have any consensus or medical literature of quality that proves that you need gram negative coverage. Well, some may say, maybe it doesn't help, but it can't hurt. It can actually hurt in that there's a concern that adding too many antibiotics may lead to more resistant infections when they occur. So conclusions, Ansef, Cephal, Zolan uh, is likely a good treatment alone. There's no high level evidence for anything. So grades of recommendation are fair to poor to inconclusive. So what is the role of operative debridement? There's an old saying that the solution to pollution is dilution. In these situations, that's not quite correct. The solution to pollution is a knife, is scissors, is to get in there and actually cut away dead or dying tissue to remove gross contamination using irrigation for microscopic contamination. You need to get this wound bed clean. You need to get this wound bed full of tissue that's healthy, bleeding, and viable. Smaller, relatively clean wounds, a single debridement is likely enough. For larger contaminated wounds, for wounds that have undergone and sustained more high energy trauma, multiple debridements may be required. It's oftentimes difficult to always ascertain what tissue is viable. What tissue is alive on the first day may not be alive on day two, three, or four. So oftentimes multiple debridements may be necessary. New technologies can help with this, but has not quite replaced the ability to avoid multiple debridements. So what else should be doing outside of antibiotics and a good debridement? Layered closure. So when I was young, I looked at closure, you'd go back into a wound that had been previously closed and you see a wall of scar. So what is the point of a layered closure? Well, doing it allows you to decrease dead space. We need to optimize modifiable medical comorbidities in terms of modifying how well diabetes is controlled in the hospital. We need to modify how well a patient has nutrition available to them in the hospital. And when we can, we want to use minimally invasive surgical techniques. So does wound closure matter? The easy answer, of course, is yes, right? We just discussed why we want to close in layers to decrease uh, dead space. What about suture material? Literature, there's no evidence that suture material makes a difference. However, the more you talk to patients, certain patients are prone to have sterile suture abscesses that can become infected. So those patients likely need to have different options. The most common one is an allergy to Vicryl. In that situation, we tend to use a monocryl or sometimes a chromic gut to help avoid these suture abscesses that can become problematic later. What about sutures versus staples? So there's a lot of folks that believe any incision below the knee needs to be closed with sutures. So again, out of our own institution, this was looked at ankle fractures, over 300 of them, some fixed with sutures, some fixed with staples. No statistically significant difference, no rates in deep infections. In fact, it trended to a slightly higher rate of infections with the sutures. Maybe that's selection bias, but is definitely not worse. What about negative pressure? So negative pressure is a wound vac that is designed to be placed on a closed wound. We know that this wound vac helps closure and helps bring even deep tissue together. We know it decreases hematoma and seroma. We know it decreases pressure and tension at the incision site. So what about open wounds with wound vacs? Well, wound vacs can be used as a temporizer in between debridements. It can improve granulation tissue. It can also really help determine the health of the wound bed. If the wound bed is able to granulate with a wound vac, that's likely telling us that that wound is healthy and vascularized. So going through the summary of evidence for negative pressure, we're gonna look at immediate impact, intermediate impact, and long-term impact. In the immediate time, our focus is the wound vac itself allows you to have a sealed wound for seven to 14 days from the external environment. 
gone are the days that we want to be taking dressings on and off every two days. It is shown here in this uh, clinical example, this is a pig model, two wounds. And when you look at the pictures here, the one above is at five days and that looks great, right? The wound is closed, it looks sealed, it's maturing, but you look five days of negative pressure at the wound below on the bottom part of that screen and look at how much more mature that wound is. It looks one week, 10 days ahead of schedule. This does make a difference. How, does, how do wound vacs help normalize tensive force? Well, as the wound vac provides suction up to the sponge, it allows it to take tension away from the wound edges. By doing that at the wound edges, that translates deeper. And you can see how the dead space becomes less as you normalize and equilibrate tensile forces. What about incision strength, right? So by taking some of the pressure from surrounding tissues as you're bringing that tissue up to the sponge, it actually makes it harder to stretch incisions. So with negative pressure, sutured or stapled, you have significantly increased force required to stretch an incision. All right, an intermediate impact. We talked about how there's decreased hematoma and seroma. How is that proven? How is that measured? Well, this was a study done, again, a pig model where they made incisions and they used an ultrasound to determine the size of the hematoma or seroma in the post-op period. You can see there's a significant decrease rate or size of hematomas after just four days of treatment. Well, how does this make sense? How is this possible? Well, they tried a novel technique. They used nanospheres, which can be tracked and followed. So in the same model, they went to the closest lymph nodes and biopsied them. And what they noticed is there were more nanospheres that were transferred from the wound to the lymph nodes. So the theory here is by allowing negative pressure to your wound, you decrease force, you decrease tension, which allows the lymphatic vessels to open up more and carry some of that extra traumatic interstitial fluid out of the wound, thereby decreasing the size of hematoma and seroma. Long-term. So long-term, if we do all those things, we should hope that we will have less scar, we'll have better incision, and patients will do better. Well, here's when we get into clinical trials. And so here's a randomized clinical trial in orthopedic trauma for high risk lower extremity fracture. So we're talking about high energy tibial plateau, tibial distal pilon, as well as calcaneus. So here we are, this was negative pressure applied for three days, not even the seven and upwards of 14 days we do now. And just in three days of treatment, we have nearly half the rate of infections and wound dehiscence. Outside of orthopedic trauma, look at revision hip and knee surgery, right? So comparing a standard dressing to negative pressure, wound complications and surgical side infections significantly decreased. Other trials looking at problem wounds. So this is outside of orthopedics. So we'll look at sternotomy as well as groin incision. Right? By using negative pressure here, they were able to find a decreased infection rate of one quarter and one fifth in both of these respectively. Now, some of this can be attributed to just isolating the wound from the external environment. Sure, but there's more to it than just isolation. Conclusions on negative pressure. So there's good clinical evidence that it works. There's great bench evidence why it works. It is an easy treatment to apply. It's easy for patients as well as nursing in terms of not having to change the dressing so much. Maybe it can affect our ability in follow-up. Maybe we can decrease how many times we need to see these patients in follow-up. So what core morbidities? So we'll switch over to medical core morbidities require optimization. Really the top of the list and probably the top three needs to be diabetes. So why do we focus so much on diabetes? Well, we know that the rate of infection is much higher in diabetics, especially those that are poorly controlled. Diabetes affects surgical sites because it affects vascular circulation. This is both vessel circulation as well as microvascular circulation. But diabetes also affects the ability of white blood cells to function. It affects sensory nerves so that you don't always know where your feet and your hands are in space and how much pressure they're feeling. Lastly, diabetes is associated with almost every major chronic medical condition. 
So how do we measure it? Well, the blood glucose level at a single time point is less important than what it is over a range, right? So A1C gives us an estimation of glucose control over two to three months. Normal non-diabetics is 6% or less. Our goal for diabetics tends to be seven or less if feasible. But what do we do in trauma? Because we don't have that ability to modulate that. We cannot delay like we can in elective surgery. So what do we do in trauma? Well, there are a lot of goals that are published as far as what do we want the blood glucose level to be. Goals translating into practice is challenging, right? So we like to order an A1C right on arrival as soon as we see any elevated blood glucose. That will give our medical team the ability to what level of control does this patient have at baseline. Now, in the private world, most of these patients get admitted to a hospitalist and they do medical management and they control the glycemic control. However, it's not always as tight as we'd like. Getting the glucose below 300 so they can go to surgery is very different than getting it tighter, getting it below 150, getting it below 120. That takes a lot more effort and that communication doesn't always happen. In the academic world, admission is often to orthopedics and you have an intern watching your blood sugars. So imagine this intern, they are a lot more scared about getting a blood glucose of 20 or 30 than they are about getting one of 220 or 230. And so it's a little bit of a culture change to educate these interns that getting that glucose below 150 is of vital importance to handle and avoid longer term complications. So what else can affect this? Well, oftentimes we keep these patients NPO, no food after midnight, no matter what time their surgery is. It's a fallacy to think that NPO prevents glucose from going up. When you starve patients, they get into that state and oftentimes their glucose levels can go up and down a lot. And so we need to be a little bit smarter about how long we have patients stay MPO before surgery. There's nursing education and the ability to think about this in a different way in terms of controlling blood glucose levels. So is there literature to prove that tight control helps? Well, here are 200 patients, right? Some controlled poorly, some controlled well the risk of infection was double in the ones that were controlled poorly. So what about nutrition, right? We're talking about diabetes. We're talking about controlling blood sugar. What about the food we're actually giving these patients? Is it better to eat in the cafeteria? Is it better to walk across the street to Chick-fil-A? Is Chipotle good just because their ingredients are supposedly fresh? What do we know about nutrition and how can we modulate that? So obesity is a chronic problem in America, everywhere in America. However, most obese patients are malnourished. A lot of calories are going in, but not the calories that they need. Trauma patients benefit from balanced diet a bit more than anyone, and you'll see why here in a second. When we look at nutrition and orthopedic surgery, there is such a significant rate of malnutrition in orthopedic trauma patients. So they come in at baseline malnourished. Some of this is lifestyle choices, as we discussed. And then trauma itself induces a state of malnutrition and poor immunity. So how do we measure this? Well, albumin is one of the easiest ways to measure this. Albumin is not a perfect way to measure nutrition. This has been discussed numerous times. However, on day one, before the surgery start, before the times of MPO, not MPO, it's a really good, simple marker to look at to get a sense of how well nourished this patient is. So when you look at albumin levels and obesity, do they always correlate? They do not always correlate, but there is a high prevalence of obese patients and poorly nutrition patients in orthopedic trauma patients. There are trends towards less complications when patients are not obese and whether they're better nutritionally controlled. So again, another study here, looking at can you evaluate the role of supplementation to help these patients. There are still no high quality studies and there's not enough studies even to get a meta-analysis. This makes sense, but we can't prove it in the literature. When you can't prove it in the literature, it's oftentimes hard to get hospitals and systems to pay for it. All right. So in conclusion, does nutrition matter? Well, obviously it does. 
and the literature shows it almost definitely it does. A well-balanced diet is important to optimize wound healing potential. It's even more important in patients that arrive chronically malnourished. Chronic malnutrition is very common in trauma patients. Obesity is a chronic health condition in this country, and it's also associated with malnutrition. So excess caloric intake, but of the wrong variety, not having the adequate fatty acids and amino acids does not help with wound healing. We know that lower albumin levels, albeit an imperfect measure of nutrition, is increased with high rates of carbohydrates and low protein. So we know that poor nutrition lifestyle choices are associated with low albumin and low albumin is associated with poor results, increased infections. So despite the literature having trouble proving it, there's likely a role for nutritional supplementation, likely a role for vitamin supplementation. What about dietary consultation? Well, here's how we go back to the albumin. There is definitely a role to have dietary consultation with these patients, not just to improve nutrition and what the patients are eating in house, but to help them get better long-term practice habits. The reason we need to prove there's a problem is without proof that there's a malnourished patient, that consultation will not get paid for. So getting an albumin level that's low, getting a pre-albumin level that's low, showing signs that the patient is objectively malnourished, allow this to be an easier transition to get a dietary consult on most trauma patients, set up a system to allow that to happen and allow them to get paid for their work, which is more likely to be long lasting. All right, so moving on to the surgery. So here's an example of a distal tibia fracture. Does timing of surgery matter? How is this handled at almost every institution, not just in America, but in the world? So you see bad blisters, you see this bad fracture, and it's a stage protocol. This came out 20, 30 years ago, where these bad fractures that have severe soft tissue injuries are first non-definitively fixed with an external fixator. So they're stabilized, soft tissues are allowed to recover, and then standard incisions are made to fix them. So this decreased complications significantly. Again, this is data from 20, 30 years ago. Well, here's an update, right? This was published more recently. And even though the protocol hasn't changed a lot, the rate of infections has continually gone down. And why has it gone down? Well, we've gotten better at minimally invasive techniques and we've gotten better at managing and understanding when soft tissues are ready uh, to operate on. Now, does every lower extremity fracture require traditional fixation, right? So here's a case example. This is an 85-year-old female with medical comorbidities on blood thinning agents. She has a fall. She has this. She has a relatively simple but comminuted distal tibia fracture. Well, you can see this and you can say, well, maybe there's adequate bone distally to allow for an anti-grade nail. Well, then there's a knee replacement up top and looking at the type of knee replacement plus the fixation, you're unlikely to be able to get an intramedullary fixation and a grade for this patient. Well, if you fix her with a plate and screw technique, is the distal bone quality gonna be strong enough to allow for immediate weight bearing? This is an 85 year old patient. 85 year old patients do not tolerate non-weight bearing very well. You'll likely have been confining them to a wheelchair for extended periods of time, as well as the bed which has a whole nother level of complications. This is not a great candidate for a hybrid or a circular frame. So what other options do you have, right? You look at her skin, it's friable. It's very thin. You can see tearing already. Is she really the candidate to do a plating technique on or is there a better option for her? So here's what we did. We did a hind foot nail that was previously thought to only be useful for fusions, but this is a acute hind foot nail you get great fixation distally and non-broken traumatized bone. You get intramedullary fixation, which is fixed above in strong cortical bone, and she's allowed to immediately weight bear. These are x-rays from about 18 months later. You can see some subtle signs of loosening of the implant, but no major catastrophe, no major hardware compromise. You see some good healing, and this patient has been walking weight bearing fully uh, since surgery. This has been looked at a little bit in the literature, but it has not been looked at 
thoroughly. So here we have two groups for elderly ankle fractures, traditional operative fixation versus TTC nail. Mortality a little bit lower for the TTC nail, definitely shorter hospital stay for the TTC nail. But what's very interesting is when you look at return to previous level of function, they're about the same, right? About the same from operatively fixing them and allowing them to retain as much motion as possible versus pushing a rigid nail across two joints. How does this make sense? Well, it likely makes sense in that the ORIF patients required a period of non-weight bearing. That level of dysfunction, they were probably never able to fully recover from that six weeks to 12 weeks of non-weight bearing, which is why they ended up with roughly the same level of function at the end. So what are the pros and cons? So the, the pros of TTC is small incisions, intramedullary implant, and immediate weight bearing. Cons, loss of ankle and subtalar motion is important and significant, though improved motion in the midfoot has been seen. You need to pick your nail wisely. The nail from the previous study does not have a locking mechanism. We used to use that nail a lot at our institution and we'd seen screws backing out. When we move to a nail that has a locking mechanism where all distal screws can be locked into the nail, we have yet to see a screw break or loosen since then. Periprosthetic fractures are slightly higher with nails because modern nails still end in the mid shaft. And so there is a increased incidence of stress reactions and breakage there. TTC nails often look easy, but they are technically demanding. Remember that the hind foot, the heel, is slightly lateral and valgus to the remainder of the extremity. And so getting a, a straight nail up can be challenging while keeping the foot in a plantar grade position and a good reduction of your fracture. So what about the brittle diabetic? If this works well in old patients, what about the brittle diabetic? So this is a 35-year-old poorly controlled diabetic that has this non-displaced ankle fracture. Well, they're sent out and they come back looking like this, right? So this is in a way a Charcot ankle. What do you do with this? Does anybody wanna open this? Even if you do, can you truly piece those together? Can you get a functional ankle out of this? Well, what about placing hind foot fixation in here? You get again, excellent fixation distally and non-traumatized bone. You get good fixation proximally in cortical bone they're allowed to immediately weight bear because it's not as if they can feel when they're weight bearing anyway. And here, two years later, you see a lot of reaction. You see some signs of loosening of the hardware, but the hardware is still in place and the patient is ambulating. So the verdict on TTC nails yet to be determined. We do believe anecdotally in some research that it works well for rotational ankle as well as pilon fracture. It allows them to get up and mobilize early. It especially works on patients with poor soft tissue envelope, especially renal failure, cirrhotics, poorly controlled diabetics, any chronically ill patients. Though it still has its complications, we believe them to be lower than traditional fixation. Next, we'll go through some cases to show some new technology and new products. We're gonna really focus on negative pressure in these next few cases. And why are we gonna focus on that? Well, standard incision management tends to be gauze and tape. Many fractures, many injuries, this is fine. But if you have any seepage, if there's any chance that there's gonna be fluid leaking out of that wound, gauze gets wet and stays wet. When you have a wet dressing on the wound, the peri wound gets macerated and that can lead to complications such as dehiscence as well as decreasing the barrier to allow bacteria to enter. Every lower extremity traumatized wound cannot be closed so well that there's not gonna be leakage. And so we have to have a better solution. So benefits of closed incision negative pressure wound therapy, again, some of this is opinion, is you have better peri wound management, right? So if there's gonna be some leakage that is brought up through the sponge and taken away, there's wicking properties on the dressing at the surface to keep it as dry as feasible, as well as it's very easy to place. And by placing it, you also get seven days, sometimes 14 days of isolation from the external environment. So that dressing that you place sterilely in the operating room will stay in place and is safe to stay in place for a lot longer than just a plain gauze and tape dressing. So here are some examples, right? So here is 
a severely traumatized open proximal tibia fracture. So you can see the open wound, you can see some surgical wounds. Well, look at those wounds, none of them look great. None of them look like those that we're not gonna be concerned about complications with. You apply negative pressure, you can get coverage over all of those wounds, you get isolation, and you get a lot of the benefits of negative pressure that we talked about just a few minutes ago. Here's another one, open traumatic wound, distal and medial. We have open wounds that are surgical wounds uh, laterally, right? So we have some wounds that are around traumatized tight tissue. You have some wounds that are just around echemotic tissue. But again, applying negative pressure here, this is one of the pre-contour designs, allows you to protect those incisions. And if you use one of these prefabricated pre-contoured ones, you can actually get more surface area. If negative pressure is good for incisions, it's likely also good for traumatized tissue, right? Improving lymphatic flow, decreasing dead space. Those are all good for traumatic tissue as well. So what types of cases did I start using negative pressure on? So here is a hip procedure on an obviously obese patient. We got a fairly good closure. The leakage you see there on the screen isn't from the actual wound, it's from the injection of pain control. All right, so good closure, but this is a obese patient. Negative pressure is likely to help with this. Here's another obese patient, but this is an infection. You can see some of the antibiotic powder there on the skin. Again, trying to get the post-infectious patient to close and obese, maybe some assistance would be of benefit here. Here's another obese patient, a trauma patient that we need to make an incision in that fold. We want to be able to protect it. Of course, we want to isolate it, but we need to protect it as well. So going through some cases that are more focused on the lower extremity. Here's a 78-year-old man with a distal tibia fracture uh, that was sent to me. He's got all the comorbidities. However, he's healthy and active. So it was sent to me in an external fixator with the fibula fixed. And so we had some options that were taken away from us, right? So you can see an x fix pin very clearly in the zone of injury, right? And this has been on now for seven to 10 days. So it is definitely colonized. And we have a incision laterally. So it's taken some of our ability to plan where we would prefer incisions. And so my technique here, we use smaller plates, but we use three plates. So we could use smaller, but we use multiple plates to try to get the same biomechanical advantage. We did not make them as long to try to avoid those colonized x fix sites. And I thought we were able to get a fairly good reduction. This technique has been beneficial in certain situations before, just not in this patient. Because a few months later, here's how he shows up. You have broken hardware, you have bent hardware, you have a significant varus malalignment. And his only option at this point was realignment with hind foot fixation, right? So as we saw earlier, so we have hind foot fixation here. We did apply some bone graft to try to get this to heal. And we also applied negative pressure to it. So here we are in the OR, right? So again, getting it out of varus puts a lot of tension on one side and allows a lot of extra tissue on the other. So we got a good closure, but it was by no means watertight. So you apply the device, right? Here he is at clinic getting it replaced after a few days. And wouldn't this be nice to have one that's pre-contoured rather than have to make this yourself? Um, here it is after just one week. So it looks pretty good, but not great, right? You can still see that the wound is healing and maturing, but not quite ready to have sutures taken out. Two weeks. So two weeks and a 78-year-old man with diabetes and peripheral vascular disease you can see how dry and mature those wounds are. There is fully grown skin, eschar. There's nothing there to suggest infection. There's nothing there to suggest any weeping of fluid. Final images at four weeks, looks pretty good. Looks like a mature, healthy wound that's unlikely to get infected or open up. Second case, so this is a younger patient definitely healthy, very active. She fell from a horse in the rain. So no medical issues. And she's highly motivated because she's got a lot of things that she likes to do outside of work. So she has a fracture dislocation of her distal tibia. So bad fracture and it was exposed to dirt, manure, mud, right? So she was taken, she was washed out. She was placed in an X-fix 
And she was brought back a few days later for definitive fixation by myself. Now, when we went in there, something didn't smell right. So we opened up the incision, didn't see anything abnormal. So we decided to open it up laterally as well, because we knew we were going to do that at time of definitive fixation. And what it was, was there was dirt that was still lodged on the lateral aspect of the distal fibula. So where I'm pointing to, that came out as well. When that went back in with this picture here, that area was no longer visible to the original surgeon. And so this aspect needed to be washed out again. So it was washed out again, washed out two to three more times before we did definitive fixation all the while high intensity antibiotics were going on. So here's how we fixed it. And here's the wound. Now this wound has been opened and washed out four, five, six times, right? And so we were lucky to get it closed. And you can see that the wound edges are not ideal by any means high rate of concern with this patient and this wound. Here it is after one week, you can see it's trying to do something, but it could be trying to go in the wrong direction as well. At two weeks, still not certain, so we reapply. And here at four weeks, after a few weeks of negative pressure, you can tell that we have a mature wound. Yes, there's eschar, but that eschar is completely dry. There's no seepage, there's no signs of infection. Four months, you have a healthy, mature wound uh, that you're not really worried about opening up or getting infected. So our previous cases showed success, right? There's a wide variety of applications, a wide coverage of multiple incisions. How can we improve upon this, right? So the next cases, we're going to show similar surgeries, similar patient issues, similar comorbid conditions, but we're going to show how can you make this better? I've been mentioning the pre contour the pre-designed shapes of negative pressure. And why is this better? Well, we think this is better because you have more surface area. Earlier, I talked about if negative pressure incision therapy is good for incisions, why is it also not good for traumatized tissue? If you think about it, we as surgeons, when we're making a decision on where to make our incision, we tend to make that surgical incision as far away from the worst of the traumatized tissue as possible. And then we apply therapy to just the incision. Wouldn't it be nicer to apply therapy to the entire soft tissue envelope, including the incision? You can get 14 days of continuous therapy. A dressing change is recommended at seven. So rethinking recovery, right? Why is the incision the only important area for swelling management? So before we get to the cases, right now we're going through a lot of issues with COVID. So can this at all help with some of the COVID issues that we've faced? you're gonna see some pictures from home. So meaning non-clinical location pictures because follow-up has been hard. Can we affect how many follow-up appointments need to happen? Can we affect home health visits? Do we need to have as many home health visits for wound changes? Can we affect how long the patients stay in the hospital? Wounds that are draining oftentimes are not sent home until they're stable. What if we placed a negative pressure incision over that? Will that allow these patients to go home? Can we decrease calls, decrease concerns? Can we make the patient experience better? So case three, 67 year old male. Again, this is an older patient with core morbid conditions that had a high energy mechanism. So it does smoke, does have diabetes, minimal hair distal to the mid shin, right? So we know there's some vascular issues going on. Multiple bilateral foot and ankle injuries. We're gonna focus on the left distal tibia shaft, which was open and has an associated ankle fracture with it, right? So here's how we fixed it. Again, not important for today's uh, talk. Here it is at the end. So you can see the open wound posteromedial. You can see some of our surgical wounds uh, there that did not have a lot of tension, right? But are in an area that was highly traumatized. Here is a pre-contour, pre-shaped designed negative pressure device that was placed over it. So you can see that we have full coverage of all the incisions. But again, remember, we try to make small incisions away from the worst of the, of the traumatized tissue, right? So here we have enveloped this traumatized soft tissue with negative pressure. That should hopefully decrease tension on it, relieve swelling, decrease the ability to have hematoma and seroma formation, improve healing, decrease scarring, all of that over the entire soft tissue envelope, not just the incision. 
this is 10 days, right? And you can tell that there was a significant amount of seepage either from the incisions or just from the skin by looking at that dressing there on the floor. You can see how much went into that dressing. This is about 10 days of therapy. At four weeks, this was a high energy, comminuted open distal tibia fracture. Look at that leg at four weeks. There's minimal swelling, the wounds are mature, there's no signs of infection. This looks great, this looks really good. And we have to attribute some of that to the treatment that was given to this patient in terms of negative pressure. Case four, and this will be our last case. Again, this is a 26 year old male, high speed motor vehicle collision, takes every drug known to man, multiple arrests, multiple traumatic incidences, not the patient we're expecting to be compliant. So this patient had a severe fracture dislocation of the talus, right? So you can see the severe open wound that's lateral based. You see bone in the wound. This is his x-rays. And you can see this is a fairly unusual fracture pattern. One that I actually had never seen before where the tailored dome was actually sheared off on its own, right? So you can see this interesting fracture pattern here with a CT scan. So what did we do? We open it up, we fix it with numerous headless compression screws, but it wasn't enough. So we had to do some soft tissue repair as well. Severely traumatized tissue there, you can see on the lateral image there, you can see that all the tissue distal to the wound looks pretty poor. Well, these patients really get one opportunity to get this closed, right? Otherwise, this is a flap this far down. And so we decided to close it. We were able to get a fairly low tensile closure. And we applied one of the pre-shaped, prefabricated negative pressure dressings to it so that we could get adequate care of the entire soft tissue envelope. When you look back at this injury, just because we operated through the traumatic wound doesn't mean that that's the only area that received trauma. This is a severe injury and the entire soft tissue envelope has sustained trauma. And we think we should treat the entire envelope. Three weeks later, you see this. And to the layperson, this may not look very good, right? There's black, there's eschar, but when you look closer, there's no drainage. That wound is completely healed and sealed. There's no signs of infection. You have what looks like a mature wound that's gonna take some time to get through the eschar. Already you can see some of the pink skin underneath that's healing at its own rate. We could not get this patient to come back. We were only able to get him to send one image. So what about other applications? So it is important to be creative. This unique shape, there's a shape designed for the foot and ankle. There's a shape designed for the knee. Be creative. You can use these outside of that. When I use the knee, I tend to turn it 90 degrees. There's more shapes and sizes to come, but they're more likely to come as surgeons are more creative in the use of them. Here is one that we used around an external fixation device. So in conclusion, we need to make sure that the wounds that we close are free of necrotic material and only have viable, healthy bleeding tissue remaining. Wound closures are very important, but this is more than just staple versus suture. This is more than layered closure. There are new technologies that can be used that may improve the chances that the wounds that are closed stay closed and do not get infected. We cannot forget how important nutrition is. We cannot forget that so many of orthopedic trauma patients arrive to the hospital malnourished. We cannot forget that obese patients are more often than not malnourished as well. And dietary supplementation and training is very important to improve outcomes in these patients. We need to manage all comorbid conditions. A lot of today we focused on diabetes because we have very specific goals for diabetics. We have an objective measure on diabetic control in terms of blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C, but we need to manage all comorbid conditions. We need to manage peripheral artery disease. We need to manage high blood pressure, chronic kidney conditions. These are all very important in preventing complications. And lastly, we need to think outside of the box. We need to look at new modern fixation techniques that may improve patient outcomes and decrease complications. So prior to concluding, we're gonna go through a few commonly asked questions. So one that's asked a lot is timing of surgery 
um, after distal tibia fractures. So the old school, what we have been taught is that you place an X-fix on and you tend to wait 10 days, 14 days, 20 days prior to fixation. More modern techniques, oftentimes we, we treat those sooner. And how do I go about deciding if it's sooner? We have a close eye on the incision, close eye on the soft tissue to see when it's ready. One thing that's important to know is fixing a distal tibia fracture three weeks out is very challenging. There's a lot of callus formation that needs to be taken down. There's a lot more soft tissue dissection that needs to occur in order to get adequate alignment of that distal tibia plafon fracture. If there are ways to do that sooner, it's, it makes a surgery easier. It limits the soft tissue stripping and exposure required and likely leads to improved outcomes. We treat getting the X fix on and getting skeletal stability as urgently as we can at our institution, because the sooner you provide skeletal stability in the form of an X fix, the sooner the soft tissue can start to recover. And so as we have placed the X fixes on sooner, we have noticed we can operate on them sooner, which limits the dissection, allows our incisions to stay slightly smaller with less deep dissection and decreased complications. Another commonly asked question is about compliance. We know orthopedic trauma patients, all trauma patients tend to have poor lifestyle choices. Part of that is compliance with restrictions with instructions. Patients oftentimes take their splint off, they take their dressings down, or they don't take their splint off, or they don't take their dressing down when they're instructed to do so. They often walk on their extremities prior to us wanting to do that. What strategies can be useful for that? Well, one of the things that we found with negative pressure incision management is that purple sponge, nobody wants to take it off. They're a little bit scared of what's underneath. And this is patients as well as some nurses. They want to keep that on, allowing that wound to stay sealed for at least seven days, which improves the ability for that to be healed. Furthermore, when patients walk on their extremities prior to us wanting to do so, that's not just an issue with bone, it's an issue with soft tissue. You get a lot of soft tissue shearing, which can be mitigated by having the negative pressure wound management system on it. Another question is, has it been tried preoperatively? Can you apply negative pressure to a soft tissue traumatized wound prior to making an incision, right? Can you apply negative pressure to soft tissues in hopes to allow them to recover prior to doing the incision? We have done some of this. It's a little bit hard because you'd have to have them available oftentimes in the ER, but on certain patients that we are taking to the OR anyway for another injury, we'll apply negative pressure to a extremity that we plan to do surgery on later. What we have found anecdotally is that we can get some of the swelling out faster. We can improve the quality of the soft tissue so it better accepts incisions and we believe that it will help decrease complications later. So I do think that there is an ability to apply negative pressure preoperatively, improve the future wound bed and decrease complications. And the last commonly asked question is an ability to get negative pressure wound dressings approved in hospital systems. There's a lot of hospital systems that pay a lot of attention to cost, to cost per surgery. And in those situations, adding a negative pressure wound device to a wound is often thought of as unnecessarily expensive and not worth the money. So I'm often asked, how do you get these approved? Well, luckily we have really good, high quality peer reviewed journal articles that show negative pressure wound therapy is very useful in certain situations. So high energy, lower extremity trauma, revision joint replacement, and some of the ones that we talked outside of orthopedics have high quality randomized controlled trials that show benefit with negative pressure wound therapy. And so that's where we start, right? You can start by showing the rate of infections with these injuries at baseline. You can look at the studies that are out there and show how these wound management systems can help decrease that. Hospitals, yes, care about costs, but they also care about complications such as infections that would lead to readmissions. 
complications such as wound dehiscence that would lead to needing more surgeries. The way they're often paid is paid by diagnosis. And so the more complications, the more length of stay, the more readmissions, they're going to lose money on that. And therefore, by finding a research proven method to decrease complications, it's an easier sell to those hospital systems. So this concludes our talk for today. I appreciate your attendance and have a great day.